Welcome to Taxidermy Truths, where we discuss the ins and outs of not only the taxidermy process, but the influences on the hunting community as a whole. With over 25 years in the wildlife and taxidermy industry, I host open conversations with artists, experts, and industry giants. From sustainable utilization to shipping rates, we dig into the reality of the experience after the safari and hear real stories worth remembering. Hi there, my name is Douglas Cocroft and welcome to Taxidermy Truths. It's quite ironic, when I was at school, I did science as a subject, chemistry being one of the components. I really wasn't very good at it. In fact, I was borderline terrible. Fast forward a couple of years, and it's incredible how often I use the skills learned at school in tanning skins. Today's discussion is about the solutions of tanning and the art form of what is essentially an act of chemistry. So first and foremost, let's look back. Tanning dates back to Mesopotamia. And I can't even pronounce the name properly. But you're talking about 3000 BC was the first sign of tanning and using leather. Today, the oldest commercial tannery in the world is found in Morocco. It's over 900 years old and still functions today as a major craft center for Morocco. The name of the tannery, if you are interested, is spelled C-H-O-U-R-A. The pronunciation again eludes me. Um, Chaura is the tannery in Morocco. Tanning for taxidermy, however, has evolved over the last 30 to 40 years. So let's move to the early stages of taxidermy and the impact of tanning on the outcome of great taxidermy. So one of the problems with having work done in Africa many, many years ago was there wasn't the same chemicals available in Africa as you could find in the United States or in Europe. And as a result, the standard of the tanning completed in the taxidermy industry in Africa, it, it was nowhere near as good as internationally, and it set the artists up for failure. We've all seen those taxidermy jobs gone wrong, the ugly ones, the bug-eyed animals with the ears that have split, the, the scrawny neck, just horrible taxidermy. Truly the butt end of many jokes. It's not that there weren't good artists back then. It was that the tanning wasn't what it is today. In order to create taxidermy that is anatomically correct and looks proportionate, you have to be able to stretch the skin back to the same size that it was while the animal was alive. Now let's keep in mind, once you shoot an animal, the skin stops living. Blood no longer nourishes the skin. The natural oils and the natural, the, the, the liquid in the skin dries out. It's going to shrink. Think of a piece of meat that turns into a piece of jerky. Or in South Africa, we call it biltong. It starts off weighing a kilogram, and before long, it lost all of its moisture and it shrunk out. So tanning is essentially replacing those fats and liquids in the skin and taking the skin to a stable state where it is pliable, soft, and it has stretch. So in today's times, the tanning in South Africa is on par with the tanning anywhere in the world because we've got the chemicals. So the chemicals and the formulas that are used in taxidermy tanning today are pretty much standard around the world. There may be small nuances, 
think of it as a recipe book. Everyone has their own little pinch of salt or herb to put in that separates their recipe from somebody else's. Tanning is the same. So the idea is to create a supple skin that has stretch, which means it'll stretch around the mannequin and retain the shape of that mannequin, which is what gives you the anatomical correctness. The primary chemical used in South Africa is an alum-based tan. So aluminium sulfate is a, it, it's a great chemical. It is, it's relatively neutral in that it, it, it's not a harmful chemical. In South Africa, the bigger commercial tanneries that do hair on rug tanning or flat skin tanning do use a mixture of alum and chrome. Whereas I believe in the US, chrome is not used because of the effluent issue. Whereas the effluent disposal in South Africa is somewhat less stringent than that in the United States. So we're using an alum based tan that creates a skin that is supple, soft, and it can stretch which means we can create beautiful taxidermy. Keep in mind, this is all hair on taxidermy. We don't want the hair to fall out. I've mentioned this on previous episodes. If the hair is falling out in tanning, invariably, that comes from poor field preparation because the bacterial infestation occurs in that skin in the first 48 hours after hunting the animal. And that's why we have to salt the animals correctly. We have to skin them and clean them properly in order to create the canvas for beautiful works of art. So let's say you shoot a buffalo and you really want a beautiful buffalo shield mount. I love skulls. For me, there's nothing better. Once the skull is done, you're sitting with this incredible rug of a hide. I mean, a buffalo hide is big. But the problem with buffaloes is they have a very sparse hair pattern. It's very thin. So when you tan it, and it goes through the tumbling and the softening process to get to that soft tanned skin, often the hair breaks off and you end up with bald patches. My personal opinion, don't ever do a buffalo rug with hair on. Tan the skin to strip the hair and create beautiful leather that can be used for briefcases, travel bags, gaiters, desk pads, you name it. There are a number of different products that you can make. But before you decide, decide on the product first and then tan the skin. Because they may be asking the question, do you want us to veg tan your skin? Or do you want us to soft tan your skin or oil tan it? Veg tanning generally gives you a leather that is akin to a saddle, a horse's saddle. It's a thicker leather. It's sturdier. It doesn't flop or drape. Whereas an oil tan skin does tend to drape. So it's a lot softer. So thinking of the use before you plan the tanning, is crucial. You don't want to make yourself a great travel bag that you would take on a two-day trip out of veg tanned leather. It's going to be hard. It's going to be heavy. It's not going to travel well. You do want it made out of soft leather. So choose your product first and then plan the tan. But for a buffalo, I would definitely get rid of the hair. It doesn't look good. A bear skin, a lot of fat, a lot of hair. They make beautiful rugs. Those skins tan flat and the hair is left on. If there are blemishes in the leather, you don't see it because the hair covers it up. So that's just a, a tip when considering how to tan your flat skin of an animal. Look at how sparse the hair is. Another African species is a gemsbuck. They don't make great rugs. They don't wear well. While we might be able to tan them with the hair on, after a season or two of walking over them, there'll be no hair left. And you'll wish that you tanned that species to leather as well. Blessed buck, impala, red hearted beast, wildebeest, common reedbuck, mountain reedbuck, springbuck. 
Wonderful skins with a hair on. The hair follicle is hardy, it softens well, and it, it really has a good lifespan. In terms of tanning for taxidermy, a lot has changed. Taxidermy in South Africa is now some of the most beautiful in the world. The chemicals are in place. We've learned, we've learned what skin requires what recipe. But I will say this, stick to your knitting. If you know American animals and the, 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 the textures and the details around an, an American skin, that recipe must stick to that specific animal. Be careful of mixing an impala and a bear into the same tanning batch because there may be differences in the chemical compositions required to tan those skins. So, courses for horses, you have to treat each animal based upon its weight, its density, the hair follicle, in order to create a skin that gives the taxidermist the very best canvas that they can get. That's a little bit about the chemistry and the, the solution of tanning. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of grams, ounces, millimeters, milliliters. <laughs> but it's information that your tanner should know. Traditionally in South Africa, taxidermists tan their own capes. Whereas in the United States, a lot of taxidermists send them to one central tanning company or facility. Again, this is based upon the regulations of being able to operate as a tannery in the United States compared to the South African tanner. Tanning is a, it's an art form. It's chemistry. It's part of every taxidermist's everyday life. When the tanning's good, the canvas is great, and the taxidermy is exceptional. When the tanning's bad, it can make your life difficult, and it can make what is normally a simple animal a very frustrating one. A little bit about tanning. Thanks very much for watching. If you've got any questions, please drop a comment below and we'll always consider getting back to you and seeing how we can address your concerns or your questions about any of these topics. Thank you.